Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and go over our next sections. We're actually be going to go over section 1.2 and 1.3. This is going to be estimation and interpreting graphs and problem solving strategies. So starting off with our overview, we have our overview is these Chuck Taylor All-Star Classics are $70 and we're having a 40% off sale. So you have $50 in your pocket, and let's say without using a calculator, do you think you can afford them? So these are the types of questions that we'll be going over in our sections today. So this process of finding an approximate answer to a math problem is called estimation. Estimation is something that you probably do a lot whenever it comes, especially to things that like cost money, which is just about everything. So uh, you probably use estimation quite a bit. So estimation is a very helpful tool in checking your answer to math problems, especially the like word problems and things like that. Estimation also leads us into rounding numbers, which is something that we'll get into today as well. And this whole process of finding an answer utilized problem solving strategies. So in this case, you know, Chuck all Taylor all stars, they're $70, you're having a 40% off sale, you'd want to find out what's 40% of $70 and then find the answer to that. So 40% of $70, um, you estimate that's probably about like $30 off. That makes it like $40, you have $50 in your pocket, you can probably afford them. So that's the kind of mentality that we're going to use here without using a calculator. As we all know, we have calculators in our pockets for now because we have phones. Um, but estimating can be a useful skill as well. First off, we're going to identify some uses for estimation. So as a recall, rounding numbers is based on the concept of estimating a number up or down to a specific place value. The value of the digit in terms of ones, tens, hundreds, and then getting smaller, we have tenths and hundredths and thousandths, and things like that. So we have a couple of steps for rounding numbers. Our steps that we have here are number one, locate the place value digit of the number that is being rounded. So you'll want to identify what number am I actually going to round to? That will probably be given to you uh, in a specific problem. So locate the place value that is actually going to be rounded. If the digit to the right of that place value, so one spot to the right is four or less, then the place value digit is going to stay the same. If the digit to the right of the place value is five or more, then you would add one to the place value digit. So it's either going to stay the same or it goes up. And actually, in addition to this, when we say if it's four or less, if it is actually four, you really should look to the next number as well. Because if it goes four and then a number that's higher than five, you technically round that four to a five. And then it rounds the five to the next number. It goes up from there. So if we see in our picture here, we kind of have this dotted line between four and five. So we're kind of looking at like, if it actually is four, you really should look to the next number to see if the four turns into a five, because then it rounds your answer up one as it turns into a five. So you always have to be wary of that. If it does end in a point four, look to the next number and see if it will stay the same or if it does get bumped up. So we have a picture here. So we say four or less, let it rest. <laughs> so there's a little dotted line here too. So we're saying kind of more like less than 4.5 or like 0. 0.45. If it's five or more, raise the score. So it goes up if it's five or more. And then we have the place here right above. So we have the decimal place. So the decimal point, which you usually say and, um, or things like that. So you have the decimal place, the point place. One spot to the left of that is the ones. So that's really going to be single digit numbers. The one, once again, to the left is tens. So double digit, two digit numbers. To the left of that is hundreds. So three digit numbers. Thousands is four digit numbers. Ten thousands is five digit numbers and so on and so on. So now going back to the decimal point, going to the right, one spot to the right of the decimal point is the tenths place. So it's like 10, but it has the THS, the tenths 
place. The next one to the right would be the hundredths place. The next one to the right would be the thousandths place. The one after that would be the ten thousandths place. So we see the numbers are going to go up just how they do on the left side with the right side. So we see those differences there. So now we can tell like where we're actually going to round. You always first identify the actual place value that you're rounding and then you go to the next number on the right to determine if it goes up or down. So this should be a review for a lot of you. If it's not, then here you go. This is how we do it. And we'll get some practice doing it as well. So we're going to do an example. We're going to round the following numbers to the specified place value. So part A, we're going to round 47.1958 to the nearest tenth. B, 54,249 to the nearest thousand. C, 0 0.0258153 to the nearest hundredth. And D, 2,411,902 to the nearest million. So we're going to go ahead and do these separately. So let's go on over to our notes. All right. So we're going to do this together. So we have our four things here. We're going to round all of them to the specified place. So starting with A, we have 47.1958, and we're rounding to the nearest tenth. So the first thing we do is identify what is the tenths place? What number is in the tenths place? We said the tenths place is the one digit to the right of the decimal place. So our tenths digit here is right here. This is the tenth. So the one is what we need to know. Is it going to stay the same or is it rounding? I look to the next one to see if I'm going to round. So one is the tenths place. The number to the right of the one is a nine. Nine is bigger than five. Nine tells us to round up. So the nine is going to tell us to round up. Our 10 spot is a one. We round up by adding one to our 10th spot. This means that 47.1958 rounded to the nearest 10th should be about, those double squiggles mean uh, like approximate, so rounding or about, this would become 47.2. And that would be our answer for that one. So the one rounded up to a two since the number to the right of it was greater than five. All right, so let's do part B. We're going to round 54,249 to the nearest thousand. So once again, we're going to identify what is the thousand place. So the thousand place in this case we know what 1,000 is. <laughs> in this case, we have 54,000. So 5 is in the 10,000s place. And 4 is the number in the 1,000s place. So 4 is the number that we're looking at. It's going to stay the same or go up by 1. So what do we do? Look to the next number. Two is less than four. Two tells us to stay the same. So just like before with the nine told us to round up, two tells us that we're gonna stay the same. And since we're gonna stay the same, really what's going to happen is that instead of rounding this up to 54,000, or 55,000, when we stay the same, the four stays the same, but everything else becomes zeros. So technically it's a little bit like rounding down. So the four stays the same, everything else clears to a zero. So this means that 54,249 rounded to the nearest thousand means the four stays the same, everything else becomes zero, and this makes it 
54,000. So we have 54,000 is our answer for B. Going on to C, we have 0 0.0258153 to the nearest hundredth. So the first thing we want to do is identify the hundredths place, just as we did before. So the hundredths place in this case is going to be the one directly to the right of the tenths place. And the tenths place is the one that's right after the decimal point. So our hundredths place is, <laughs> wrong one there. is right there. That's our hundredths place. Just kidding. There's our hundredths place, wrong one. So there's our hundredths place. It's the two decimal places. So our first one, the tenth, is the zero, and the next one is the hundredths place, the two. So just like before, we go and we look for the next one. So the one number directly next to the two to the right is a five. And as we remember, a five tells us to go up. So five tells us to round up. So that means that our two and our hundredth place will round up to a three and all the rest of our decimal places basically just get dropped. So this number here, we say it's going to be about 0 0.03. So all the rest of the numbers after the two all go away and the two goes up to a three. All right, so let's go on to our last one here for D. We have 2,411,902 to the nearest million. So we start by identifying which number is in the millions place, which in this case is the one all the way to the left, our 2 million. So this is our million. So just like every other time, we look to the number to the right. So we're gonna look to the four. So we look to the four, the next one is a four. Remember what we said about fours? We said when we have a four, we kind of want to look to the next number two. So four is a little iffy. So we want to look to the one to the right as well. So we'll also look here. And the next number is a one. One is less than four. Four is going to stay the same. So one tells us to stay the same. So that acts on the four itself. So four stays a four. So we'll put in parentheses the four. So the one tells the four to stay the same. So it's still gonna be four. And four also tells us to stay the same. And we're talking about the two in this case. So we saw that when the next number was four, we look to the number after as well. So the one had the four stay the same. The four tells us that the two is going to stay the same. And so since technically two is going to stay the same and we're rounding, we're going to round this down. All the numbers after the millions place will turn into zero because we're rounding to the nearest million. That means the only options are two million or three million. And the four tells us to go down or stay the same technically. So two stays the same, all the other numbers will get wiped and it will just become two million. So always keep in mind when you're rounding, you're always trying to round to an even number or a smaller number or something like that. So 
you'll have zeros, the numbers will just be shorter, things like that. That's what's going to happen when you have rounding to specific numbers. So all right, that wraps up that example. So let's on, go back to our lecture. All right, so moving on, we want round numbers to give levels of accuracy. So when we use estimation to simplify a numerical calculation, we can use two steps. So the first step is round the numbers being used to numbers that make the calculation more simple. Then step two, perform the operations involved. So when estimating numbers, we can do rounding to kind of make the calculation a little bit easier. These steps help us to make approximation, but it can lead to some issues being things like overestimation, which means that you've made something more than the actual value or underestimation, you've made it less than the actual value. So we have a picture here with um, some, some carrots and some bunnies. So if we look to the one on the left, we see like the greenery of the carrot was like very big. It was very bushy. So like in that case, we would kind of assume like, oh, it's probably a big carrot, but the carrot is actually very small. <laughs> so that would be an overestimating. We overestimated this carrot from like kind of what we saw. The one on the right hand side there would be an underestimation. The greenery of the carrot was like very small. It wasn't that impressive. So. We don't really think that the actual amount should be very much, but it was actually a lot more than we thought it was going to be. So then we have the overestimation and the underestimation there. Um, so same thing when it comes to rounding numbers. Overestimating, you've estimated and that value was a lot bigger than what you what it should be. Or under, underestimating, you've estimated and those values are a lot less than what it should be. So those are the two things that we always want to look out for. So as an example, we're going to talk through this one. We say your mom asks you to buy 27 lottery tickets and they cost $1.79 each. So if you want to estimate like your mom asked you to buy these tickets, you're like, how much money do I really need to bring? So if, for example, you estimate 30 tickets for $2 each, would this be considered overestimating, underestimating, or fairly accurate? So if we're really looking at it, it's 27 lottery tickets and they have a cost, 179. When we estimate, we estimated up. We went up to 30 tickets and we went up to $2. So in both of those quantities that you were looking at, you rounded up for both. So if you do 30 tickets for $2, it's just gonna be $60. So that $60 compared to the actual value it's probably going to be more. You've probably just overestimated since you took both of those units and rounded both of them up. So this would be overestimating. So when you have multiple units of things and you're rounding them, in this case, you rounded them both up to higher values, greater values, which means that your result will be greater than the actual value. And that's overestimating. So there's an example of overestimating. Now the same question, but instead you estimate 25 tickets and a dollar fifty each. So in this case now you've rounded down from 27 to 25 and you rounded down from 179 to 150. So you took both of those units and you went lower. So in this case, overestimating, underestimating, fairly accurate. This is going to be an underestimation. You took the actual values and you went down. So that would be underestimating. So taking both of those and rounding up was overestimating. Taking both and rounding down, that's underestimating. Let's see if we do a combination. So we do a combination. You estimate 25 tickets for $2 each. So in that case, you rounded down the quantity, 27 to 25, but you rounded up the value, 179 to $2. So you took one and rounded down, and you took the other and you rounded up. So you had a combination of those two. 25 tickets, $2, that's $50. If you knew the actual value of whatever the situation is, you would definitely have a really good idea. This is all about estimating. So we're just talking about like the theory behind estimating, but let's go ahead and actually calculate the value. 
27 times 1.79. We could do it in calculators or even our phones if we have them on them, although we can't have those for exams. So if you actually have 27 tickets at $1.79 each, that comes out to $48.33. In this example that we have here, we're saying it's estimating $50, and that is very close to the actual value. So this would be fairly accurate. So that's always a strategy when it comes to estimating. If you are estimating things and you have multiple values, try to make it somewhat even in rounding up and rounding down. So in this case, it was a quantity of tickets and the cost. So by rounding one of them up and one of them down, you should land somewhere pretty close to the actual value of the thing that you have. So always keep that in mind when it comes to estimating. Try to have even amounts of rounding up and rounding down to try to keep it close. If you have all of them rounding up or all of them rounding down, it's not going to be as good, although it will probably be in the same ballpark, but it won't be nearly as close. So all right, so rounding numbers to give levels of accuracy. How do I know what digit to round to? And there's not really an exact answer for that. It's a little bit more of an art than a science. So it really would just depend on the numbers themselves. How much work do you wanna put into this estimation? If you wanna put in very little work, you're probably gonna round a lot. If you're like willing to put in a little bit of work, then probably you don't need to round as much. Um, and then how much work you're putting in, you may as well just grab a calculator if you're gonna put in a lot of work. So rounding is really kind of subjective. It's up to you on how much you wanna round, how accurate do you need your answer? So like we said, unfortunately, there isn't an exact answer. It just depends on the numbers. So for an example, we say an apartment complex wants to buy six fridges for new renovations. Each fridge costs about $579.99. It's easier to round $579.99 to 600. That would give you the easiest like computations. But I mean, one cent, that's closer to $580 than it is to $600. But if you really want some really, really easy calculations, 600 is good. And then you multiply by six. So 600 times, or $600 times six, those fridges are gonna cost you somewhere around $3,600. You overestimated though, so it'll probably be less. It's good to know that. If we rounded it to a more accurate number, so instead of rounding $579.99 to $600, if we instead round to $580, which is only a one cent difference, multiply that number by six and you get $3,480, that, that answer is going to be more accurate because you rounded closer to the real value. So it all just depends on the level of accuracy that you really need. If it's just like quick mental calculations and there's nothing wrong with using 600. If you want a little bit more accurate, then try 580 instead of 600. They're similar numbers but one is definitely closer to the real answer <laughs> and extremely closer to the real answer at that. So deciding how to round is really a trade-off, ease of calculation versus accuracy. And here we have a little fridge with a little cow. So, all right, estimate the answers to problems in our world. So we've just looked at like how to estimate really what it comes down to, all those things. So now we're looking at estimating in real world problems. So useful or interesting information is often displayed in forms of graphs or graphical forms, things like bar graph, pie chart, or a line graph, which is all what we see here. So we see a pie chart. Those are pretty typical. They look like a circle where you have slices of the pie. You've probably seen all of these before. A bar chart where you have values and categories and you have different uh, values represented with bars. And then you have a line graph, or sometimes it's called like a time series graph. And you see that certain values have just been plotted against the values. And then a line is drawn through those values. So what they all specifically do, starting off with a bar graph, so the one in the middle here, we say a bar graph is used to compare amounts or percentages 
using bars that correspond to the respective amounts or percentage levels. So we're kind of measuring levels in this case with bars. A pie chart, which is also known as a circle graph, is used as a circle representing a total that has been divided into sectors that correspond to the percentage size of the sector. So we have a big circle, we've cut our slices of our pies, and each slice corresponds to a percentage of the whole. So the purple slice here is probably somewhere around 25%. It's about a quarter of the pie. And the orange slice is close to a quarter as well, though just a little bit bigger. And then we can see how each slice here is a little bit different. So those would be percentages of the whole. Then lastly, we have a line graph, which is also known as a time series graph shows how the value of some variable quantity changes over a specific period of time. So a line graph is typically used with time, where time is on the bottom axis or the x axis, and the values are on the vertical axis or the y axis. So we see those values get plotted for like a time and a quantity, and we can see how it changes over some period of time. So those are the different types of graphs and forms that we'll end up seeing. So we're going to do some examples together. So example here, we have estimate the median starting salary for each career subject in the bar graph. So we're going to estimate uh, based on all of our graphs here, we're going to estimate each starting salary. And then we have, which career subjects do you think have the biggest difference in pay? And we might end up with a couple or so, um, but so we're going to look at which ones have the biggest difference. So which is the lowest, which is the highest. So let's go ahead and go on over to our notes and figure this one out. All right. So we have our graph here. We're going to estimate their starting salaries. So first off, starting at biology. We're estimating, we definitely see that the values are there. We, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And we're just going to estimate kind of its placement within those ranges. So starting with biology, we have the top here. And we can kind of draw like some dots across. Whatever biology is, it's probably at that value right there. And we can estimate that value. Mm, it's close to 40. It's definitely kind of past the halfway mark. So more than 3,500 or 35,000, probably closer to 40,000. Any number in between is probably going to be okay. Um, let's go with like 38,000. That seems good. So biology, we'll kind of write it a little bit slanted here. We'll go with that's about 38,000. All right. Let's actually move that just a little bit. <laughs> like there. What are a little line? There we go. Talking about that one. Then we have our next one. We have business. So we see this is where our line is right here. We can kind of do the same thing, kind of dot this across. It's probably like right in there. So in this case, business, it's just a little bit higher than that line. Um, not really a whole lot. So probably 41, 42,000, either answer of that is probably going to be okay. So let's go with like 41,000. It looked just a little bit more over the line um, than how biology was under the line. So we'll go with 41,000. Anything around that is good. Remember, this is estimation. So it's a little bit more of an art form than a full science form. So this one here, we're going to say this is probably about 41,000. 41, all right, before this gets any messier, let's go ahead and erase some of these, erase some of those dots. And we'll move on. So communication here, we have communication. If we look, communication looks the same as biology. They look like they're at the exact same level. We can even draw a little line across to kind of verify. And yeah, they're pretty much at the same level. 
So whatever we said for biology, we're just going to repeat that for communications. We said biology for us was 38,000, so communications is also 38,000. I'm going to squish it in there now. All right, so now on to computer science. So with computer science, we're going to switch to highlighting instead of the dots. So computer science, we see it's above 50, less than 60. It, it definitely looks about halfway. You can even draw a line a little bit here. Oh, that's not a very small line. Let's go there. Draw a little in line. Probably can't see that all that great. Like there. It's probably about halfway. Looks about halfway. We're estimating that. So it's probably 55,000 or about 55,000. Let's go ahead and erase those lines. And we say this value right here, we have to write this one sideways. It should be about 55. All right, so then moving into economics. At this point, we probably don't necessarily really need to like draw the little dotted line anymore, although you can definitely still do that if you want. But if we look to the next one, economics. Economics is just barely under the 50 line. And since it's just barely under that 50 line, we can probably say that's probably 49,000. It's probably just one less. So when you do start estimating and you have more values and more things that you start estimating, your estimations kind of start turning into comparisons of the one you've already stated. So economics, it was just under that line. We said biology and computer and communications for that matter, were also right under the line, but this one is more under the line. So it should be more than the difference between those lines for biology and communications, but it's still not quite 50. We said that biology and communications were more like 38,000, right under the 40 line. So economics in this case, right under the 50 line, but closer would probably make it 49,000. So economics, we could say is 49,000. All right, then moving on to education. Looking at education, it's lower than biology and communications, but it's still pretty close. It's still kind of in that halfway, but it might not be exactly like halfway, like how computer science was. Computer science definitely looked half. Education might even look just a little bit less than half. So maybe this one, we draw that line across and kind of use that as an example. And we're gonna do our best try to make it as accurate as possible you are going kind of a farther different distance so it's kind of harder in that sense but maybe it's like right in here it looks like it's just shy of half and if it's just shy of half we can probably say that's probably like 33 or 34 thousand so if it's just shy of half let's go with it's probably 34 thousand let's go with that one so 34,000 for this one. If you decide that you think that looks like more like 33,000, then by all means, you can write 33,000. It's all just estimating. So all right, our next one, we have English. So we see it's once again, it's going to be right underneath that uh, 40 line, but it's not quite right underneath. And... It looks just like biology and communications. So looks about the same. We'll give it the same value. Should be about 38,000. So there we go. All right, next one we have nursing. So nursing is past the 50 line and it's a little over that line as well. Um, it is a little bit over that line. We said for business, it was a little over that line. And we said it was 41,000. This probably looks about the same. Let's call that 51,000. If you said it looked like 52,000, then that's fine too. So, all right, this one, we're saying nursing is 51,000. 
All right, political science, easy one, it hit the line. That's 40,000 right there. So since it didn't really go above or below, we say it is exactly 40,000. Then our last one, psychology. Now, if we look along, this is the last one. If we look along the values that we've already found, psychology looks about the same as education. So let's go ahead and make it the same one. So psychology should probably be about 34,000 as well. All right, so we've stated the median starting salary for each one of our categories at this point. Our last question, this last part here, we're just figuring out what's the difference between the highest and the lowest. If we look here, computer science is definitely the highest one at 55,000. So the difference between highest <clears throat> starting salary and lowest starting salary is, we're going to find that difference highest starting salary we said this is computer science let's make that red and the lowest starting salary the lowest in this case was education and psychology they had the same so whichever one they still have the lowest value but those are the categories that had the lowest value. So education slash slash psychology. And then we find the difference. 55,000. Minus the lower one, 34,000. makes our answer probably about $21,000. So the difference is about 21,000 between computer science and education slash psychology. So all right, there was estimating with a bar graph. So let's go ahead and see what the next one's going to be. All right. So we did this example, let's go on to our next one. So with this example, we say this pie chart represents the number of fatal occupational injuries in the US for the year 2013. If the total number of fatal injuries was 4,585 for the year, estimate how many resulted from falls. So we have our fatal occupational injuries um, pie chart here. We have a couple different things, so we see that this kind of like pinkish one was assaults and violent acts. That was 17% of all the injuries. Blue one here, we have contact with objects and equipment accounts for about 16% of the total. Falls account for 14% of the total. Exposure to harmful substances accounts for about 7% of the total. Fires and explosions accounts for about 3% of the total. And transportation accounts for 41% of the total. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to figure out, we're going to go back to our notes and we're going to see how many of these uh, fatal injuries were attributed to falls. All right. So here we have our picture. Again, we have our pie chart. So we see all the different slices of our pie and we see the different percentages. We're told that the total amount of fatalities in this case were going to be 4,585 in total. So we have percentages. We want to find out what is the actual number of falls that occurred. We're saying that 14% of the total was the number of falls, but what is the actual number? So in order to find this actual number, we need to find what is 14% of 4,585. So we'll go ahead and write that. So we say falls is 14% of 
4,585, 14% of the total. So in math language, kind of how we read that, when we see the word of, that's going to end up meaning multiplication. So of means multiply. And then we have 14%. One thing that is commonly forgotten that we need to remember a lot is that we don't use percentage in math equations. Percentage re responds or like reacts to out of 100. So we have 14%. That really means 14 out of 100. So we always want to put that into decimal instead. The way decimal works too is that we can always assume that there's decimal at the end of that number. So 14%, that's probably like 14.0. We'll just put the point there. To put it into decimal, we would move it two spots to the left. So it needs to be in decimal. We can also just divide 14 by 100 in like a calculator or something and find the same number. But basically, this is going to turn into 0.14. 14% in decimal times, and we're going to use the dot for times, 4,585. And we want to know what this is equal to. Now, at this point, we go into our calculators. We type in 0 0.14 times 4,585. And the number we should get is 641.9. Now, if we really think about it, 641.9. Well, uh, I don't really know what 0.9 of a fall is or 0.9 of a fatality. So you're probably gonna run around your final answer. Um, so also, it doesn't necessarily say like round your final answer, but you have to take into consideration the context of the problem. You're talking about fatal occupational injuries. You can't really have like a percentage of an injury, like you're injured or you're not. So that's gonna account for whole numbers. So we're gonna need to round that to the nearest whole number. 641.9, 0.9 tells us to round up. So we'll round up to 642. So in, for our falls, there would be Six hundred and forty two falls. Six hundred and forty two falls because that's what fourteen percent of four thousand five hundred and eighty five was. So, all right, that's how we read a pie chart and find actual values of a pie chart. So, all right, let's go ahead and go back and see what the next one is. All right, so we just wrapped up this question. Our next one is a line graph. So we say this line graph shows the number of Americans living below the poverty line according to federal guidelines. So we have Americans in poverty between the years of 1990 and 2015. So part A, approximate the number of Americans living in poverty in 2015. So you need to find that number estimated according to the graph. And then B, estimate the year where Americans living in poverty first hit 40 million. So now you're going from the value to the year estimating that year. We have the number of people below the poverty line in millions, so these numbers are talking about millions, and then we have the year across the x-axis. So let's go ahead on over back to our notes so we can kind of doodle on our graph a little bit to find our answer. All right, so we have our graph again. For part A, we wanted to know how many people were below the poverty line in the year of 2015. So we're going to find the year 2015, We'll find the value that corresponds to that year and then report that value. So first thing, 2015, let's find that point. 2015 is actually the last year. We don't really need to do the tracking part because it's going to be just the last value, but we can do it anyway. So 2015, we go up and it's the last value on our graph here. So this is the value of 2015. Now you actually find the value. So I'll trace across back to those values as well now. 
So I'll go this way. Making sure it's as straight as possible. Um, you always want to try to make it accurate. <laughs> Looks about right. <laughs> so we can probably assume it's between the values of 42 and 44. The only number between there is probably 43. We're estimating, we're not trying to get any super specific numbers. We're just rounding to the nearest million. So it's between 42 and 44. So it's probably going to be 43 million. So in the year 2015, there would be about 43 million people living below the poverty line. All right, so now we're gonna do it kind of the other way around as well. So for part B, we have 40 million in what year? So now we're going to go to the 40 million value. We're going opposite. So we're starting at the 40 million value and then we'll find the year using the same method as we just did in reverse. So We'll go here, trying to make it as straight as possible, of course. And then it looks to be about right there. That looks like 40 million. So now we're going to find the year by going down. So we'll trace down as best as we can. And it looks to be about whatever year that is. <laughs> so in this case, it's definitely past 2005. The next one would be 2010. So there's a five year gap in there. This value right here, it's just a little past 2005. It's definitely not at the halfway mark, which we would probably assume the halfway mark is like 2007, 2008. So this is probably gonna be 2006. So, 2006. That's what I would say for these graphs. If you read these graphs and you're like, I think that looks like 44 million for part A and 2007 for part B, then that's probably okay. And that's also a good estimation. Remember, you're just trying to be as like accurate as possible. Um, but estimating, like I said, a little bit more of an art than a science. So as long as your answer is close, that's really what matters, as long as it looks accurate and representative of the question that was being asked. So, all right, that wraps up that example. Let's go on back over to our lecture. All right, so we just wrapped up this question. Moving on, we have the four steps of basic problem solving. So our four steps for basic problem solving is number one, understand the problem. Write down what the information is provided. Identify what's really being asked. So just pretty much figuring out what am I trying to find? Then step two, devise a plan to solve your problem. Some common strategies would be like drawing a diagram, using some trial and error, using skills, uh, I spelled it wrong, it's okay. Using skills like arithmetic or algebra or geometry, things like that. So try to figure out what you're going to do to solve the problem. Step three, do whatever you figured out for step two and actually try to solve the problem. So carry out your plan to solve the problem. Once you've made your plan, try it out. If it doesn't work, try a different strategy. So try it until you can get it right. Then step four, check your answer. Analyze if it's reasonable, use the math to confirm your answer. So you'll wanna check your answer, of course, see if it is right, see if it makes sense those kinds of strategies. Referring back to like steps two and three, a lot of the time in math, we have what I like to call a mathematical tool belt. So you have all these things that can work pretty well for a lot of different things. Um, so you have a lot of different tools that can work for lots of different applications. And so you just wanna try out your tools on these applications or whatever problem that you're trying to do. What tool is gonna to work best? What's going to actually work? What is not really going to work? And it's okay to use different tools on the same problem to try to do it correctly. And it's okay, you won't always know what tool to use right from the get-go every single time. And that's all right. 
it's always about trying to figure it out using all the different tools at your disposal. So, all right, those are the four steps of basic problem solving. So let's go ahead and try it out. So we have our last example here. We're setting up a fenced area to have a tailgate at UNR's upcoming football game. You have 100 feet between two roads to use as the width and 440 feet of fencing to use in total. So we want to know what length will use up the total amount of fencing and enclose the biggest space possible. We're planning on having a ton of people at this tailgate. We want to make sure there's a lot of room. So we want to use all of our fencing and create the biggest space possible. So here is our space that we have here. So 100 feet between the two roads. So assuming that there's probably roads here and here, and there's 100 feet between them. So we know that the widths are going to be 100 feet, but we don't know the two lengths. So we're going to try to use what we know about shapes and rectangles, maybe even squares, in this case, to figure out what can we do. This is also going to require us to know things like perimeter. So knowing perimeter will also be important. So perimeter of a rectangle. These are things that we should have learned previously in classes way back when, or maybe recently. So we want to use our mathematical tools to see if we can figure out the problem. So let's go ahead and go on over to our notes and figure it out. All right. So we have our picture here again. We want to remember the total fencing is 440 feet. So of my fencing, that's how much I have of it. 100 feet on each side here is already being allocated towards that. But so, like we said, we can use perimeter. We can even maybe just use the information that was given to us to find the value. Either way, we're going to go over perimeter. We're going to look at perimeter of a rectangle. The perimeter of a rectangle, we say perimeter, would be equal to 2 times the width, so we'll write w, plus 2 times the length, so an l. We said width was 100 feet, so these are the widths right here on the sides. That means that our other two values there are going to be the lengths. So these are the lengths, and then here. So we already know how much the width is. The width is 100. The length, we don't know. And the perimeter of this entire rectangle would be the same as the total amount of fencing that we have. So perimeter is equal to the number of total fencing, which we said was 440. So kind of combining these two ideas together, we get 440 perimeter is equal to two times the width. The width we said was 100 feet. So two times 100. We can put it in parentheses. This also indicates multiplication. And then it's plus two times the length. I still don't know what the length is, so I can still write L. And now I can kind of, I can try to work on solving for the length. I can start simplifying. Two times 100 is 200. So we have 440 is equal to 200 plus 2 times the length. This is our next step. I'll indicate with like a little arrow as next step. So we have 200 plus 2 times the length is equal to 440. I want to simplify this. Getting rid of that 200 is probably the quickest and easiest way to work on that. So I'll subtract 200 from both sides. Four forty minus two hundred would be two hundred and forty. And this is now equal to two times the length. I don't know what the length is, but I know that this is times two. And if I just want the length, I'll have to get rid of that two. Since it's being multiplied, we can divide both sides by two. The twos cancel on the left, and now I want to divide 240 by 2. We'll go on in this direction. 240 divided by 2, 
comes out to 120. And this is in feet. So my length is 120 feet. So I know how long this is going to be now. I've found this answer. It looks, looks good. It's more than 100. The length looks longer in the picture that we drew out here. Although pictures could potentially be misleading. But yes, we determined here's the value. So we can go ahead and just double check our answers really fast. We know that these answers here are 120. So I can go to my calculator and I can type in the addition or the sum of all these different sides. The widths were 100, so I can do 100 plus 100 plus my two lengths, 120 plus 120. And that value should equal 440 feet of fencing. That means my answer was correct. So the length was 120 feet. I double checked it. It works out with our total number of fencing. And that would be our final answer. The length is 120 feet. So, all right, that wraps up that example. Let's go on back over to our lecture. All right, so we finished up that example and that wraps up our lecture. So in summary, in sections 1.2 and 1.3, we learned how to identify some uses for estimation, rounding numbers to give a level of accuracy, estimating the answers to problems in our world, using estimation to obtain information from graphs, and the four steps in basic problem solving procedures. So, all right, that wraps up sections 1.2 and 1.3, and I'll see you in the next one.